Well, Greg is uh, left yesterday afternoon sometime. He's doing a, um, a revival at uh, Stone Memorial, uh, sort of the church he spent so many years at. Uh, there is a uh, youth minister, I believe, growing up in as well. But he's there through Wednesday night, uh, going to be preaching a revival for them. But we're going to continue on in the series we've been in that we're calling Chameleon. And, and again, the reason we're calling this or having this as the idea of the series is that you know a chameleon, the way that God created that creature, has the ability to change the color of its skin. And, and of course, it does this for a number of different reasons, but one of the reasons it will do this is so that it can sort of blend in with its environment. Like if there's a predator around or something it's trying not to be noticed by, it can sort of blend in to what, whatever it's on and, and mimic that color. But the whole point of this series is, is that we don't want to be like the chameleon. You know, that as, as followers of Jesus, we're not just supposed to blend in so much or blend in so much to the, the pattern of this world or the culture around us that we become indistinguishable from it, that we're supposed to be different. Okay, we're, we're supposed to stand out in certain ways. And so that's what we've been talking about through this series, different ways that Scripture teaches us that we are to be different, that we are to stand out. Uh, Listen to what the Apostle Paul told the Philippian Christians. He said, do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that's the sermon this morning, okay? That's it, we're done. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. That's what you got to work on this week, okay? That would be enough for a lifetime, right? To do everything without grumbling or arguing. I mean, think about how different we would be from the world if, if we just did that. But he goes on, he says, so that... You may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Now, stars in the night sky, they don't just blend in, do they? How many of you were out yesterday evening when it was dark and the stars were out? And anybody outside and notice? I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it was just a clear night. You could see everything. I mean, it was beautiful. And you know that you can't hide the stars. They're going to stand out. You know, they don't don't just blend in. And today, we're we're actually going to go back to the passage Greg uh, preached on last Sunday. And we're going to pull out one little aspect of that that Peter talks about uh, that shows us how we are to be different. A specific way we're to be different. So in this passage last week, Greg uh, talked about how Peter shows that, or talks that we were chosen. You know, that, that we're chosen by God, by His grace, um, that we don't deserve that because of our sin, but God chose us to be His people through His Son, Jesus. And that that amount of love, okay, that amount of mercy, should motivate us to be different. Okay, to, to be different. So let's go back to this passage again. And again, I want to look at a very specific way Peter calls us to be different. So he says, But you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession, so that you may declare to others the goodness of God, for He called you out of the darkness into His wonderful light. So there's one phrase here that Peter uses to describe Christians that i like us to focus on this morning. And I want us to sort of unpack a little bit of the biblical history of this because it can teach us a lot about why and how we are to be different if we are a Christian, if we're a follower of Jesus. So Peter said there, if you're a Christian, you are, he said, a royal priest. Anybody ever called you a royal priest before? Probably a royal something else, but probably not a royal, royal priest, okay? But he called royal priest, uh, a holy nation, God's very own possession. So this royal priest imagery or language that Peter is using here is a call back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, where God is leading Moses and the nation of Israel out of slavery from Egypt. He's delivered them from that in a powerful way. And He's leading them. And finally, they get to the point where they reach the base of Mount Sinai. And it's here that God gives them a very special mission. And that's what I want us to look back at. So, uh, picking up in Exodus chapter 19. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. 
and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So God's mission for Israel, God was telling Moses there, was to be a kingdom of priests. You know, when we think of a kingdom today, you and I think of it, we usually think of like a physical place. Maybe we think of, and something old is usually something like you know, Camelot or, you know, these, the, we just don't use that word kingdom a whole lot these days. But we usually think of a, a geographical place when we use the word kingdom. But the kingdom of God is, is not so much a, a physical place. The kingdom of God is where the king is obeyed. It's where his will is being done. It's like Jesus once said to his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so he gives what we call the Lord's Prayer there and teaches them that. And as he's teaching them that prayer, this is one of the things he says, that you're praying to God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's kingdom coming, his kingdom being present, is anywhere his will is done. When it's done on earth, as it is in heaven. And and in those moments, we find the kingdom of God present. So if Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests, they're going to be a community of people whose mission it is to do the will of the king, whatever it is. And when they do that, when they follow that, his kingdom is present. In every single thing that they do, in every place that they go, so it's not defined just to one place. God's mission to Israel was, look, I've chosen you. And He chose them by His grace too. There wasn't anything special or unique about them. He just chose them to be the people He was going to work through to bring the Messiah into the world. But He says, I chose you. I want you to go out there and live passionately for Me, doing My will. As if you were announced to the world, God is reigning, and this is what it looks like. Watch us to see what the reign of the king looks like. I mean, think about it. A priest in Israel, particularly in the time of Moses, that was sort of what they were supposed to do. Yes, they prayed prayers for the people. They brought sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. But in a very, very real sense, they were to display what God is like to a watching world. So imagine God's heartache when you know, His chosen people the treasured possession Israel didn't show the world what God was like or what God looks like by the way that they lived. I mean, if you've read through the Old Testament much, you know more often than not, they served other gods or worshipped other gods or they forgot God or they put other things in priority over Him in their lives. So how are we doing? I mean, because look again, what did Peter call us. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession, so that you may declare to others the goodness of God, for He called you out of the darkness into His wonderful light. So this, is the, this is the amazing part of what Peter is saying here to me, because I know none of us will ever fully understand the ways of God, and this is one of the ways that baffles me. God controls the entire universe. He can have the allegiance of every single person on this planet like that. He's God. But instead, he says, I want to use you. I want to use you to declare and proclaim my goodness to others. I want you, in a sense, to display, put on display to the world what it looks like for the kingdom of God to be present. For it to be a reality. A few verses later, Peter added this. Live such good lives among your unbelieving neighbors that even if they accuse you of doing wrong according to their values, they will see your good behavior and give honor to God when He judges the world. So God, through Peter, is saying, Put me on display to an unbelieving world, you followers of Jesus. So again... 
How are we doing? How are we doing? Do we want people to judge what God is like or form an opinion about God based on what they see in us? If we were honest, most of us would say, no, (laughs) I do not want that responsibility. Uh, I do not want that at all. But guess what? God does. That's exactly what God would like to see through us in the way that we live our lives. Do our lives, our marriages, the way that uh, we act at school, the way that we act on the job, the way that we act on the ball field, the, uh, the way that we handle disagreements and conflicts, the way we live our lives in all those areas, does it say God is reigning and this is what it looks like when God reigns as you watch my life? It should. We won't be perfect, but it should for the most part. Obedience matters. Obedience matters. Now, it doesn't save us, okay? We have been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's only through Christ that we're saved. But obedience still matters. Once we've accepted that gift of God's grace through Jesus God's saying, okay, I want my kingdom to, be, to come through you. I want my will to be done through you on earth as it is in heaven. That's our mission as a royal priest, as Peter was saying. So how do we do this effectively? You know, how do we do this effectively in the kind of world we live in right now? I mean, times are constantly changing, but in the times in which we live, how do we do this? I like to think of, for the time we're in right now, I like to think of Daniel as a good example of, of this is how I can figure out how to do this. Again, in the world we live in today, with, again, with so much moral compromise, so much bitter divisiveness uh, between people about this issue and that issue and all these other things that are out there, the, the only hope that I see, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm right, but the only hope that I see for our culture to improve is spiritual revival. I believe it's revival or bust. I believe that's where we are. And I believe that's only going to be led in the best way possible by obedient, loving, and unshakable Christians. The kind of followers of Jesus who are going to enter into culture, who are going to be amidst culture, not completely blend into it, but we're called to be different, And we're going to engage people like a breath of fresh air. Something that's different than what people are seeing right now. That we're people who are not perfect. We don't claim to be. But we're just men and women. Boys and girls. Okay, Doing our best to love God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, and all of our lives. And to love our neighbors that way. And this is what I love about Daniel. This is what I love about his story. You may remember that Daniel was taken captive, along with lots of other Israelites, when the nation of Babylon invaded the nation of Judah in 586 B.C. And they came in there and they destroyed the capital city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple at that time. And they took Daniel and many other, it it talks about many other gifted, bright young men, took them captive away to the nation of Babylon so that they would serve in the, in the king's court there. Now, we don't have time to read all of Daniel's story this morning or recount all of it, but here's what I want you to do for me. Before you go to bed tonight, please read Daniel chapters 1 through 6. Do that before this day is over, because as you read that, you'll see that during the 70 years that Daniel was in captive in Babylon. During all those years, Daniel shared his faith with every king that ruled during that time. Without compromising his faith, uh, without compromising his obedience to God, he found a way to do that in a nation that was polar opposite of everything he had grown up with. All the values, the beliefs, everything completely opposite. Yet he found a way to effectively engage that world And be a witness. How did he do it? 
Well, if you read those chapters, you'll see that one way, one thing he did not do was that he did not condemn everyone he disagreed with. That's what we see over and over again. He did it through humble, honest, and respectful persuasion. We see him doing that over and over again through those six chapters. The humility that Daniel had about himself, the respectful way in which he engaged people who opposed him or believed differently than him. Without Now, he didn't change truth. He didn't compromise on truth when he did this, but there was a respectful way he engaged with people in those moments. And then you see over and over again the consistent godly behavior that he had time and time again throughout all those years he was in captivity. And eventually, what you see is that started to attract even his opponents. It started to attract them to Daniel. And not all of them, but many of them, he won over. Even kings. Even kings. So what I want to do is just, for the rest of our time together, just focus on one practical takeaway. Just one thing that I think can help us be these royal priests that Peter was referring to. Help us be the kind of person that Daniel was as we engage the world in which we live. And here it is. Keep your standards high and your grace deep. Keep your standards high and your grace deep. Listen to what the Apostle Paul told a young minister named Timothy. He said, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they only produce quarrels. A servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, And be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts. And they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Notice that Paul, as he's telling Timothy this, as he's describing Timothy's opponents, or those who would be opposed to him, that they are following Satan's schemes, that they're doing the devil's will. They're not just in the parade. Many of them are kind of leading the parade. And yet Paul's telling Timothy that the goal of your interaction with them is not to see God's wrath and judgment poured out on them, but your goal of your interaction with them is to hopefully see God's grace and mercy poured out on them. So they will come to repentance. So they will come to a knowledge of God's truth. In other words, our primary goal is persuasion. Like Daniel did. Persuasion, like Paul was challenging Timothy to do here. Not condemnation of those who oppose us. Not not winning the argument at all costs. I've got to win. Now, that's the one I think we struggle with sometimes the most. Is winning the argument at all costs. Notice the specific actions we're called to take. Paul said to Timothy that you know, you're not to be quarrelsome. He said, don't have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. So is Paul saying that as Christians, we should never publicly disagree with anything. We should never publicly disagree with anyone. Is that what Paul is saying? I don't believe so, because Paul did that himself, as you read about in the book of Acts. When you look at this word that's used there, quarrelsome, you go back and look at some of the original meaning, it really carries the idea of that the idea is we're not going to go out there intentionally trying to seek out useless shouting matches with people. That we're not intentionally trying to go out there looking to get involved in useless shouting matches. Can anybody say social media arguments? Okay, Useless shouting matches. Nothing is accomplished by that. Look, God wants His truth proclaimed. He wants the gospel proclaimed. He wants us to do that without any shame, okay, whatsoever. To do that confidently. But to do it with respect for the hearer. For those who might be listening. Who did Paul tell Timothy to be kind to in this passage? Be kind to everyone. Yeah, I double-checked the Greek on that. Guess what that means? 
Everyone, yeah. I was hoping there would be a loophole there, but there's not. It, it still means everyone. That's exactly you know, what it means. On most occasions, even opponents or those who disagree tend to listen better if you treat them with a little respect. I'm not saying they always do, but on many occasions, even opponents will listen a little better if they're treated with respect. But when those who disagree with us, as we share God's truth, as we share the gospel with others, if they insist on getting in just really antagonistic and getting in shouting matches that you know are not going to accomplish anything, Paul's telling Timothy here, the best thing to do is don't get involved in that. It's kind of like Jesus told his disciples as he sent them out to the different towns. He said, if you go to these towns and you share uh, the news that the Messiah has come, and they reject and reject and reject you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Now, I'm not saying you if you encounter resistance that you change your truth, change the truth, God's truth. We don't. But if we find that it's just a useless shouting match, the best thing we can do is just remove ourselves from that situation. I love something else Paul says here. He says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Is it our job to change people's hearts? No, it's not our job. Jesus said in the Gospels that that was going to be the job of the Holy Spirit. That He was going to change a person's heart. He would bring up a, a point for that person's heart where they are convicted by the truth or they're moved by the truth. I'm glad that's not our job. Our job is to faithfully, confidently share the truth of God, share the gospel, and the result of that or the impact or effectiveness of that, that's something God is going to bring about. I'm thankful for that. So I think, again, this is how we should be a royal priesthood that doesn't conform to the pattern of this world. This is how... This is how we're to be different. That let's, let's stick to God's ways. Let's stick to God's word. If God's word says it's a sin, then it's a sin. And so don't, we shouldn't fall into the pressure that culture is trying to put on us to say, well, no, that's foolish. That's foolish to think that or to believe that. Well, no, if it's what God's word says, then I'm going to stick to it. Because the world will always think, that God's truth is foolish because in so many ways it's held captive by the schemes of the devil. So, let's keep pointing to a higher standard. Let's keep doing that. Keep pointing to the higher standard without any shame. Let's make sure that our lives are honoring that standard, that we are doing our best to be obedient to that same standard. But at the same time, Let's make sure that we are extending and we are offering and we're constantly talking about that deep, deep grace and mercy that God offers that all of us need every single day. All of us need it. As best we can, let's make sure people know that we do care for them. We do care about them. Even if I cannot agree with the choices that you're making, or the lifestyle you're choosing to live because of what God's Word says, even if I can't agree with that, let's do our best to make sure they know we, we do care. That God still loves them. Okay, no matter what they've done, or no matter what they be might believe right now in the moment, God still loves them. But He loves them too much to leave them that way. And that's why He sent His Son so that we could be saved. And that God can help to change their life just like He did our lives. And one last thing. Let's make sure, again, we keep that standard high. We keep God's truth out there just as He says it is. But let's make sure that we're always painting a picture for the world of what it looks like to come home. Kind of like when Jesus was telling the parable of the prodigal son. He had gone out 
chose his own path, which was the wrong path, finally realized it in his coming home. And Jesus said, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. His father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on, on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. We should be like Tom Bodette in Motel 6. Now remember that catchphrase? What was the catchphrase there? We'll leave the light on for you. The porch light will always be on. The door will always be open. And if you ever change your mind, if you ever decide that the path you're on is not working, if you ever find your place, self in a place that is just miserable and you're longing to come home, let's make sure, Christians, that we are living our lives in such a way that, they, that we are going to be one of the first people that they call in that moment. Because they know we're there to listen. They know we are there to help them however we can and, and ex, be an extension of God's grace and mercy in those moments. Be a royal priest. Let's fulfill that mission.